This is the FlipNerd.com Expert Real Estate Investing Show, the show for real estate investors. Whether you're a veteran or brand new, I'm your host, Mike Hambright, and each week I bring you a new expert guest that will share their knowledge and lessons with you. If you're excited about real estate investing, believe in personal responsibility, and taking control of your life and financial destiny, you're in the right place. This is episode number 379, and my guest today is my pal, Martin Boonzeyer. Most real estate investors get started in the business as a one-man or one-woman band, where we're doing every aspect of the business. Now, if you enjoy that, there's nothing wrong with it. However, if you want to move beyond being self-employed and have a team to help you grow your business, you're going to love this show. Today, we discuss the typical key roles in a small real estate investing business, as well as a bit on how to find the right person. Having the right people in the right seats on your bus is critical and can ultimately make or break your business. Plus, Martin is just an awesome guy. So in today's show, we really casually discuss both of our experiences with finding the right people to put in the right seats in our real estate investing businesses, all aimed at trying to help you overcome some of the challenges that you might be facing. So let's get started. Please help me welcome Martin Boonzer to the show. Hey, Martin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be back. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you again, man. You too. So um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic today because you know a lot of a lot of real estate investors and uh, really almost all real estate investors start as a one man band, and then we all have these challenges of trying to grow a team and build this into something to where we're not effectively just self-employed. So it's going to be a good, uh, good discussion. I mean, I know I've had challenges with it. You've had challenges with it. I think a lot of us that, a lot of us that really are into this business sometimes look back and say, man, I don't think I'm that good of a manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or even if you are a good manager, like sometimes we find it, it's just hard to find good people, right? It is. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. And- well, hey, before we, before we jump into this topic, maybe just tell us, uh, for those of you that don't know you yet, maybe share your background because you've got a pretty exciting, uh, pretty interesting background. Well, thanks. Yeah, it, I've had an opportunity to do some pretty exciting stuff, to be sure. Um, you know, my, my story, I to go all the way back, I'm really proud to be the child of immigrants. It's not as common from Europe these days for kids to actually be for, uh, second generation. My parents came across on a boat, you know, with $40 in their pocket and my oldest sister in their arms. And so uh, that uh, work ethic has just been a, an inspiration to me, and it's just part of what's really driven my evolution as an entrepreneur. Because I, I went to school to be an engineer, worked at Motorola, and I really enjoyed it, but I always had that entrepreneurial bug. And then kind of completely on a different realm altogether, I was also um, involved in the sport of judo. And it uh, just turned out while I was in graduate school that I started to have some success there. And... Um, while I was uh, working as an engineer, I actually managed to make uh, two Olympic teams back in 2000 and 2004, and so represented the USA uh, in the sport of judo as a heavyweight. And um, but uh, as that started to wind down, that's really when uh, uh, my focus went back to being an entrepreneur. Uh, I enjoyed being an engineer, but just boy, sitting in that cubicle all day, every day. It was dark when I arrived. It was dark when I went home. Yeah. It's just, I wanted something different. And uh, so I, I, I moved around, did a few different things. I want to say moved around. I bounced around from a couple different types of opportunities, but uh, settled into uh, real estate investing about 10 years ago. And as you pointed out, I started as a one-man band, but I haven't been, ha- couldn't have been happier. It's, it's really, uh, real estate investing provides so much variety and opportunity. And, and um, I'm just uh, really uh, feel privilege to be to have the opportunity to build this type of business. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And by the way, for those that are listening right now, uh, Martin was on the show about a year ago. Um, and we've known each other for several years, but he was on show number uh, 328. And he talked about a little bit more about uh, the similarities between being uh, an Olympic athlete and real estate investing and just kind of lessons learned, of just working hard and never giving up. And you know, when you're when you're a professional athlete, uh, a lot like a real estate investor, you fail a lot, right? I mean, you just have to go yeah. through those processes. You just got to get back up and keep going. So that was a great uh, episode. So if you guys want to, we'll add a link down below the video here back to that one. But um, but yeah, you should check out that show as well. So awesome, man. Well, yeah, so we're, today we're going to talk about 
I know the fact that a lot of us start is like one one person, an individual. We're doing everything. And uh, if you left, like you're you're like me, you left corporate America, right? I'm not like you in that I was never an Olympic athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't uh, claim anything there though. But uh, but for sure, you know, you just wanted something different and better. You wanted yeah. to not be limited by your upside potential. But then what happens is we get thrown into this world of real estate investing where we're kind of doing everything. A lot of times we're probably working harder than we did when we were in corporate America. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I, sometimes I, I got to admit, there's times I look at some of my, my friends with envy, you know, they continue to climb the corporate ladder. They're at this point in their life, they're getting five, six weeks of vacation and they get to turn the phone off every day at five o'clock. And, yeah. off, you know, there's definitely some advantages to being part of corporate America. And, uh, um, and I miss some of it, but I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. But as you pointed out, it's not always for the money. You definitely put in the hours um, when you're self-employed. Yeah. Especially early on when you're doing everything yourself and, you know, even if, if you start rehabbing, it's like everything becomes your problem, right? Like there's a yep. water heater that's not working or I remember some yep. of the early days of things like that. I met my sons. Uh, I was somewhere with my son. I was like at a, like a school event on a weekend and somebody called, we had a house that was rehabbed and for sale and uh, somebody called the realtor sign, which got routed to me at the time, which I don't do any of that anymore. But it was like, hey, there's like, uh, there's a flood of water coming out of the front door of this house. Oh, like, boy. Oh, man. So the water heater had burst. But that was like, okay, I have to drop everything and I got to go. And I don't know how to fix a water heater, but I had to go deal with it, right? So, yeah. But yeah. So talk about maybe, because um, I, I think there's a lot of people that are real estate investors that get stuck. Uh, you know, they say, I'm an investor, I'm a business owner. We say all these words, I'm an entrepreneur, but really they're self-employed at that point. So just talk right. about that reality and then how you need to move forward. Just get started. Well, I think you point out something uh, that's very, uh, you know, there's a lot of confusion out there in the sense that a lot of people do call themselves business owners or entrepreneurs. When, when uh, There's really two different categories. When you're an investor and you're a one-man band, as you put it, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I know some extremely, and I'm sure you do too, some extremely successful and wealthy uh, investors who yeah. they, whether they're doing single family or multifamily or whatever it is they're doing, they they manage to make a phenomenal living with a lot of freedom. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think there's a lot to be said for being and remaining an investor uh, or even like notes, for example, that's a great way to be an, another great way to be an investor where you really don't need a team. Sure. And so, just because we're going to kind of start talking about building a team and trying to transition from being an investor to being a business owner, I guess I just wanted to put that out front. It's just because you can or maybe doesn't necessarily mean you should. Right. right. Uh, and uh, but because it is very different. It is very different to from being a guy that's going out there, identifying opportunities, seizing those opportunities and, and then flipping them or turning them into rentals versus building a company that does that. There's a lot of a lot of different um uh, components to that conversation, but certainly, a, a you know, for me, it was a pretty s slow process. I know some people, bam, they, uh, they just make things happen very quickly. But the first step for me, Mike, was just to bring on an administrative assistant. Yeah. And, uh, but really that's, that's still kind of, I see that as kind of the first step, but you're still an investor. You're an investor with some help, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and it was that your experience too, that just yeah, the first, it, turns, it turns out, hire? uh, so my first hire was an admin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's pretty common. A lot of people say, you know, what, who's the first person you should hire? Cause I know we're going to talk about some of the key roles, which are typically an admin and then, uh, an, an acquisitions manager, salesperson, basically, or yep. home buyer, whatever we might call them a lot of different things. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, the admin role is critical uh, to help alleviate you. Cause it turns out there's just, you know, no matter how much technology and stuff we have, this is still a pretty administrative heavy business, right? With contracts, yeah. and lots of paperwork yeah. and lots of sending emails to, uh, you know, uh, deal with transaction management, like all those things that really are a much, you know, very, very administrative role, right? Are you looking to change your life through real estate investing? If you're interested in either getting started or taking your business to the next level, please check out FlipNerd's private program at theinvestormachine.com. This is the most robust real estate investor coaching, networking, and mastermind on the planet and designed for your success. 
If you're ready to roll up your sleeves, ready to take personal responsibility for your own success, and ready to dive into a world-class instructional coaching program that provides you step-by-step instruction to help you achieve financial freedom, then you should apply today. Spaces are limited and candidates are only considered after an application and interview process. Our 12-month investor program is unparalleled. Think you might be a fit? Learn more today at theinvestormachine.com. Lots of paperwork yeah. and lots of sending emails to uh, you know, uh, deal with transaction management, like all those things that really are a much, you know, very, very administrative role, right? Right. Um, yeah, my, my path is the same as yours then. The first hire was an admin and then um, and then the first sales or acquisitions person. And I think that the acquisitions person is where you really start to see the potential of transitioning from investor to business owner because now somebody else is out bringing in deals while you are doing something else. And that's a really exciting feeling yeah. when the first time that happens. I remember that actually. I The first guy I hired... Um, just so happened about a week later my wife and I went on vacation and uh, I think I got three or four messages while we were in Mexico you know picked up another one picked up another one yeah and he actually got really got off to a really great fast start and it was just super exciting just sitting there and go wow I'm literally on the beach you know you see all those commercials of real estate <laughs> which has never been my life but right. in this instance I was literally on the beach getting text messages about uh, another deal that he picked up. And so that is really, really exciting uh, to make that transition. But it's probably the scariest as well, because most of us are who we are and the service we provide is so wrapped up in that one-on-one belly to belly, you know, experience sitting down with the property seller to try to work out a deal and to hand that off to somebody else is really challenging. And, uh, and you really do need to have some real confidence in that person and uh, to make that transition. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about, um, you know, we just had our, I told you we had our first uh, mastermind this past weekend. Investor Fuel is the name of our mastermind. And oh, cool. We talked a lot about that, about how, um, you know, you, you've got to rely on somebody else to do. So a lot of us as real estate investors, we probably would say the, every role is important. The administrative stuff is important because stuff could get really screwed up. But that key role of going out, we spend so much money on advertising and lead generation to to basically be funding that to somebody else that's out kind of on your behalf trying to buy houses is um, is scary, right? When you first start, you're like, I'm this is like everything in my business. If we don't buy houses, we don't have a business. And I'm, I'm just kind of investing in this person to go buy on my behalf. I mean, that's one of the, the scariest parts. But, you know, what, what we were talking about in the this past week at Investor Fuel was like a lot of times we get hung up on how people can't do things as good as us. If you've done it by yourself for a while, even if you don't like to do it, you just get good at it because you have to to survive, right? And so right. you're always worried about like, well, they can't do it as good as me. And there's some people that have like a rule of thumb. Well, if they can do it 70% as good as you, then that's good enough because you could scale or you get a little bit of your life back or whatever. But yeah. yeah. How'd well, you overcome, how'd you talk about how you kind of overcame that? Cause you, you know, a lot of times for me, this is what I've generally thought. I'm, I'm the best acquisitions manager I've ever had, but I would be in my car 24 seven on appointments. If that's, if, if I was the only person doing that role. Well, I think it was a factor of a couple of things. One, um, I've done a lot of reading uh, about and talking to other investors about growing my business. And one of the things you'll hear over and over again, and I'm sure the people listening, this isn't the first time you'll hear this, um, but hire people that are better than you. Yeah. And so I think the first step of that is acknowledging that there are people better than you. <laughs> right. And uh, so, you know, for me, that wasn't actually that hard to accept. I, you know, as an engineer, uh, in my background, you know, when you think of engineer, you don't necessarily think of stellar salesmen. So uh, it's something that I learned and I know that I did well at, but I could, it, for me, it wasn't a stretch to believe that there could be somebody that would, uh, could do better than, than me. Right. And it was just a matter of finding that person. And uh, so um, I think that's a, a big part of it is not only finding somebody who's better than you, but then also then letting them, letting them do their job. Yep. And, uh, and it is, um, you know, it can be a tendency to micromanage. I know that can be one of my tendencies, but just to let find somebody that's better than you and then let them do it. Um, because if it's going to be a business, you have to really believe, you know, have to see the end from, 
you have to see the goal that you're moving towards. Right. If you truly want to be a business owner, then it really starts boiling down to numbers. I'm spending this, and it you know every dollar of advertising is bringing this much in revenue and that type of thing. And um, if you want to make sure you are maximizing every single penny and you are the one on that appointment, well, that's okay. But then you're an investor. You're not you're not a business owner. Right. And so I guess it just, it really comes back to what do you really want? You have to believe in, in your team if you want to be that business owner. And, uh, uh, you know, like I said, it's not for everybody, but if you do find somebody that is, is, you know, is better than you, it's a great feeling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing, when you make the decision, just to kind of give people some advice here, when you make the decision to build a team, you have to offset that cost, right? So you've got to, and ideally, and then some, right? So, if your goal is to buy a house a month, well, you're not going to be able to afford to have a team and you're going to do everything. So sometimes like deciding to, um, to bring other people on board kind of goes hand in hand with scaling up. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's actually something I've thought a lot about as well. Cause when you're small, you might be able to, you know, have a relatively small, a minimal marketing budget and pick up a you know, a couple easy deals. Right. Um, and that might be enough volume to, to make the money that you're looking to make. Right. But once you start hiring people, you need to have much more consistent revenue. And, uh, at least our experience has been in the Phoenix market. And I expect yours in Dallas as well. It's gotten so competitive that if you want to do twice as many deals, it's not as simple as doubling your marketing budget. You might have to quadruple your marketing budget in order to get twice as many deals because you're, you know, that whole bell curve, you start out at the peak, right. but the further you go, you know, the, your, your spend might become less effective. And, and actually I think, you know, we're, we we're talking about just a second ago, identifying what your strengths are and maybe what somebody else might be able to do better. That's one of the areas where I feel my engineering background is, has helped out. I really enjoy the systems and designing a process to maximize uh, the return and to be able to track your business and that type of thing. And so I've invested a considerable amount of energy and effort in that regard uh, because it can easily get out of hand. That's something we experienced as well. We're like, okay, sure. so you hire a few more people and you start dramatically expanding your budget, but then all of a sudden if your conversion ratio starts dropping substantially, you can start losing money pretty quickly as well. Yep. And so it's really important to have um, not only good people, but you also have to have good systems if you're going to scale. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I think, uh, too, that's what, where it's good to have an acquisitions, we call them acquisitions manager, acquisition specialist, home buyer, whatever you call them, the sales role that's out looking at houses is, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge when you first start if they're a hundred percent commission based, but if you have a really good salesperson that basically if they don't, they don't kill it, they don't eat. Um, right. And, you know, if you, if you find the right person, they thrive in that atmosphere of out finding deals. Sometimes as a business owner, if you, if you, if you're not sales acclimated, acclimated, I don't know, if you're not, uh, you know, if you're not, if you know that you're not the best salesperson that you could find, then sometimes we get a little bit comfortable with like, oh, we made, you know, we made $30,000 a month, we made $40,000, whatever the number might be. And you start to get a little complacent where if you've got a salesperson that is, that is, um, that only gets paid if they're doing deals. They're usually much more aggressive with finding more and more deals. They're never, they're never kind of full, if you will. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, would, I would agree hundred percent. They've got to be commission driven. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk, let's talk about the key roles. We've talked about them a little bit here, but obviously like an admin or we, sometimes we call them a coordinator or I call mine an office manager, whatever that role might be for you. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, if you think about your business, if you're listening to this right now and you're, you're a one man band or a one woman band, you know, think of the roles you do. There's a whole bunch of administrative stuff. There's kind of the acquisitions piece. Um, there's maybe raising money or something like that. If you, if you're managing rehabs, like re managing projects, you've got to have a project manager type role. Right. Um, and, uh, there's a, like a marketing manager role if you're doing, if you could for lead generation. So typically we're doing all those ourselves at early on. Yes. Right. And then, like you said, uh, for a lot of people, their first hire is an admin, um, and then, uh, an acquisitions manager. So let's, let's maybe just talk about those two, cause those are the primary ones, uh, that a lot of us, uh, have filled out. Cause like a marketing manager, you know, I still do things myself. There's stuff like that, that I, 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 yeah. I don't, that, that's not a full-time role for me. Right. And probably not for you, but yeah, uh, but I, I, I would agree. I think marketing is one of the highest return activities in your business. 
Uh, and it's probably one of the the last ones to outsource. At least been my it's my experience, and it's and uh, it seems like the other investors, including yourself, uh, would agree. The acquis uh, the op you cut out there for just a second. You said the office manager and the acquisitions manager, correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. The, one of the challenges I think you'll find, at least I found when hiring is, is when you wear all those different hats, uh, my tendency is I wanted to find somebody that had experience in all those areas so they could help me in all those different things. And I just, well, I guess the, the short version of the conclusion to that is you're not going to find it. Yeah. Uh, because so what I ended up figuring out is rather than trying to find the person with all sorts of great experience, I just wanted to find the right person that I wanted that I wanted in my office all day. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody that I can connect well with that wants to do this work. You can teach pretty much anything, but if if you don't have somebody that you enjoy working with, um, it doesn't really have the you know the desire to be part of your company. Right. Even if they got all the experience in the world, it's it's going to be a struggle, and yeah, so I agree. That's we've uh, recently uh, retooled a lot of different things in our company, and including uh, the personnel, and uh, and that's what we've really focused on this this time around with much better results. Is let's find the right people, um, and we can train what they don't know. Right. But I can't tr I can't train somebody's attitude, right. somebody's uh, um, you know perspective and and just their, their outlook and that's yeah. where uh, that's really made a big difference for us so I think uh, for the office manager that's really a key obviously experience you know running an office is great but the I would say the first and foremost find somebody that aligns with your values that you can want to be around that understands what you're about and is and is interested in supporting that not just the activity but the values yeah and has a good work ethic too right I mean I've oh for I've sure. had people that are like you know, if they work until five, it's like four fifty-five, and you see they're like packing up, like ready to go. And then I've had people that, you know, I don't expect people to like work overtime or, or like, you know, we, we, there's no such thing as overtime when you're <laughs> an investor. Like, yeah. that. you're just you're just on. But um, yeah. but there's people that I, you know, I have uh, somebody now that's like, you know, she stays late if we need to. We'll just just gets it done, whatever whatever needs to happen, and so. I think that's yeah. an important part. Do you, I would say, and I don't know about you, I, I would say at this point, I generally try to find people that don't have real estate experience because they, they tend to come with some baggage and like preconceived notions about how things are supposed to be done. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. Um, and now that you mention it, it, that the last, my last two hires um, have fallen in that category. Just great people that I wanted on the team don't really have the real estate experience, but um I agree with you. In my mind, that's the least important. Um, the main thing is the uh, uh, what you're what we've already been talking about: the values, the work ethic, the um, you know, just the a good fit personality-wise in your office. And that office manager is it's really an important position. It's a that almost everything in our business will go through her at, at some point or another. Yep. And so it's in a way kind of like the glue. And, um, and so it just makes it, uh, that much more important that they can function as, as, you know, a glue in your business and they're not, um, you know, creating problems or division. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, would you, you want to maybe take a, a, a couple uh, minutes and just talk about, cause I know you from a systems and a process standpoint, you're pretty buttoned up on at least the process for recruiting. You want to maybe share a few thoughts about like how you, how you find people, like where you place ads at and, um, and w what kind of criteria you're looking for? <laughs> well, I think you've given me a little more credit than I deserve. I, <laughs> I, am, I did just say a few minutes ago that I'm a process oriented guy. I wish I had a great process that could just predictably churn out great people. Yeah. And I have not found that process. <laughs> um, in fact, but my, my experience, the last, uh, uh, the last year has kind of taught me that, well, a couple of principles. One is increasing the salary advertised amount on Indeed or Craigslist is not going to necessarily bring you better people. Right. Um, and, um, and actually, my pr I, I've tried hiring and interviewing directly. I've tried hiring through a recruiter. Um, but the best that I've made have been people that weren't necessarily looking. 
that came through referrals and through relationships. And so that's my preferred hiring strategy at this time is to continually to keep the door open to let the, uh, through the network of people that I do business with uh, professionally, personally. Um, and if you find, you know, that man, I, I don't remember, I think it might have been Gary Keller from Keller Williams. He's got a really, you know, well-known reputation as being a systems guy and a recruiter. Sure. Um, I believe it was him, but I could be wrong. Uh, said, you know, he's always looking for the right people. And if he finds the right person, he'll hire them and then find the place to put them on his team. Yeah. I wish I could say I have the budget to do that. And I yeah. don't necessarily. But that is the type of mindset that I'm trying to incorporate is really just to be focused on the right people. And, and I would say even more so for the sales position, because if somebody is a really outstanding salesperson that wants to make the kind of money that's possible to be made in this business as an acquisitions manager, yeah. um, chances are if they've got great work ethic, they've got great people skills, they get along, they're probably not looking for work. Um, and so that's... Um, that's my thoughts on, on finding that person is is really is if you're in a rush you're in a hard spot you're in a you're yeah. kind of under the gun that makes it much more difficult but if you can keep those feelers open put the word out through your I don't know LinkedIn through your church through Facebook whatever your network is um, and then try to hire based on the connection rather than the For sure. instant need yeah that's been one of my one of my biggest challenges is sometimes, you know, as a small business, you can't, generally you can't afford to have redundant positions. Like if somebody, if my office manager leaves today, I don't have a, I, there, there for a long period of time, I had two admins. Well, I do still have, I mean, I have a bunch of virtual assistants too. So we right. just fall back on them now when we need to. But when I first started 10 years ago, I, it was a few years before I started using VAs. Uh, but I had one office manager and if, if something happened to them, like there was nobody else, you know? And then when I went to two, right then it's like, okay, if something happens to one of them, the other one could take it over for a while until we fill that role. But I, I, I agree with you. I, my, one of my biggest challenges has been that I historically am hiring when I'm in a difficult position and I need to fill that role fast. And you just start to overlook stuff. Like you say, oh, yeah. I'm not very good at that, but I'll just, I'll just do that. And you know, that part of it. And that's, that's a bad position to be in. Yeah. And, um, I went through that several times this year and, uh, and that's why I'm not claiming to have any answers. I feel like it was really, for me, as an answer to prayer. Uh, we lost our last office manager, and I just made the decision, I'm not going to rush into this. And um, so uh, I just we just stepped up. A lot of it was me. I started working extra long days and just because I didn't want to force myself into uh, another hire that may not be the right fit. And, um, and through that, though, we've just, you know, um, we, we did find somebody that that's just been just yeah. a, a, a wonderful uh, and an answer to prayer. So it, uh, but you know, I've been in business for a long time. So I, I guess all of us get a stroke of good fortune. Yeah, uh, for sure. You know, for sure. Yeah. Occasionally. Yep. Yep. So. But I think you're right. You always kind of, you, when you're a small business, even though you can't afford to just hire people left and right, generally um, you should always be looking for, I, I always say, I, I've historically always said, I'm always looking for good athletes. Like if I could find the right yeah. person, then then I might be able to find a role for them, especially like you said, salespeople. Right. Yep. Yeah. So what makes a good salesperson? Let's talk about the kind of acquisition manager role. What are you looking for in those roles when you, uh, when you hire somebody or when you're looking to hire? Um, a couple of things. One, um, I, uh, work ethic is extremely important because a salesperson is essentially self-employed. They're, they earn commissions. Um, even though they might be working for you or for me, uh, their income is entirely derived from their level of activity. So they, they need to be able, because sometimes the best lead is the person that calls at, on Saturday night or Friday night at 7 o'clock. They want to meet on Saturday morning and then leave town because they are just in town for the weekend and want to take care of this property or whatever. It's just an example. Yeah. But sometimes the most motivated and the people that you can help the most call at goofy times. Yep. So that's, you know, that work ethic has to be there to be willing to pick up the phone um, and return calls. And, you know, the, I'm just as an example, Kim, the, the latest salesperson I just hired, we were just talking yesterday. One of the things I really appreciate about her, she's like, you know, when I'm done for the day, then I think, okay, I'm just gonna make 10 more calls. 
and she goes through some, you know, ten other leads that maybe just haven't shown a whole lot of interest. And, you know, we picked up a deal this week because one of those people just happened to be at the right time, and we and she was able to go out. And now there was no longer a big line of people knocking on their door because it kind of faded off. Yeah. And uh, and locked up that deal. So, um, it uh, uh, it just goes to show that that extra, just willing to walk that extra mile, not only for work ethic, then also, um, so so that's that's point number one is the work ethic. For me, uh, not necessarily in priority or sequence, but just yeah. So yeah. Um, it's on the checklist. But, yeah, but then um, <laughs> also, uh, it, I don't know. I don't want. To, wouldn't say they have to have experience as a salesperson, but it's certainly really helpful if they do. But the main thing is, is even if they don't, they have to just have a natural ability to establish rapport and to show empathy and to know when to, you know, when to listen. Uh, too many salespeople just want to talk, 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 talk. Um, it's not about the condition of the house. It's not about, you know, well, I don't know enough about construction. None of that really, all of that's overcomable. If you can just establish, you know, you've heard the saying, people don't care, know, care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. And so that's really, those are really the main things for me. Someone's got to be willing to work and they got to be able to connect with people. And if they can do those two things, I can teach them everything else they need to know. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. A lot of times people are looking uh, historically, I was looking always looking for the like slick polished like salesperson. Oh no. But yeah. but no, I mean early on that's what I look for. But it's like, no, I just need somebody that can be a good listener, you know. Yeah. 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 And and truthfully, I, I actually I trained uh, a couple people yesterday um, on my theme area like for acquisitions and I was just like the best advice I could give them because you can it takes it takes going on appointments to to learn, right? Yes. And uh, I was like it's okay to just kind of play dumb. Like just, you don't really know, just be a good listener, show them you care and you want to help solve their problem. And that'll yeah. overcome like 75% of the concern yeah. you have with being a good salesperson, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree hundred percent. And in people, I think appreciate humility and candor. And there's, and I agree with you. I teach that to my team too. There's nothing wrong. And even if it's, you know, you, the investor, the owner of the company, if you're on an appointment and somebody asks you something that you don't know, just, Man, I'm sorry. You, you, I, I'm not really sure about the answer to that question. But here's what I, you know. But if you listen to them, you show that you care because, and you want to get them an answer. Just get back to them uh, rather than make something up or whatever. Yeah, I don't recommend that at all. Right. Right. Yep. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, what, what? Let's, uh, let's kind of talk about some advice on how to move forward. I think what you said up front, which I want to emphasize again, is. <clears throat> If you're a one man band or a one woman band, let's say you're doing it all yourself, you just have to think like some people do that forever and, and they're okay with it. It's not a bad thing. Like, I don't want to make, I want to make sure we didn't position that as a bad thing. It's just like, there's this uh, concept of stay small and keep it all right. Like you don't start right. carrying on all this burden and overhead yep. and have to manage people. If you don't mind hustling like that and doing whatever it takes whenever it takes to get stuff done and you don't mind doing a lot of the work then there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that right um I, yeah Go ahead. absolutely not i i there's a it's a real upside actually being able to yeah. you know if you want to just shut it off for a little while so you know what i want to do something different or i'm going to just take a couple months and go travel with my family or whatever you can do that right um when you have a team of people that all have families to feed you have you're on all the time, right. you know. So there's definitely some real advantages to staying. Uh, and when you say staying small, it doesn't even necessarily be small. Like I mentioned earlier, there's investors who learn how to grow really, you know, you know, a lot of wealth, but just by doing different or bigger deals. Yeah. And so I, um, I don't think it's something that somebody really ought to. If you feel like you ought to do it but you don't really have the heart to do it, then don't do it. Because yeah, just like starting in business as an entrepreneur, it's a whole, it's it's that same type of all over again to go from being an investor to being a business owner. It's almost like an, a, a different enterprise altogether. For sure, for sure, awesome. Well, any, any kind of final words of wisdom, Martin, on people that, if, let's say that maybe give some advice to the person that says, I'm doing it all right now, I, this isn't really what I want. Like I want to build a small team so that I can grow a little bit and uh, and be able to expand and be able to. A lot of us get in this business so that we can have, we can 
you know, have a little more freedom. And when we take our, taking our kids to school or going home early or taking a, a long weekend, even if it's every week, whatever it might be, which is hard to do that if you're the only person doing yeah. everything. But for that person that wants to grow a little bit, maybe kind of give some words of wisdom on where they should start. Yeah. So I think, um, one of the, the first place I would start, I would recommend is if you aren't part of a group of people that have are at the level of success you want to be at, join a group. And I'm not, and this, this is not a shameless plug for your mastermind. Yeah, whether it's your no, I didn't mastermind. Pay you to say that, but we'll add a link <laughs> no. for it anyway. <laughs> but but that was really pivotal for me. I started in a mastermind, and uh, you know, because this business can be a little lonely. You know, nobody at church for or sure. my friends really understands this business. They think you're a real estate agent or whatever. <laughs> they just don't really know. Right. Um, and uh, so just to be around other investors who are, you know, it's for one, it, it's it's just nice just to be able to kind of be open and, and talk about your struggles and see what other people are doing. So it's, it's fun. It's really informative. And for me, it really challenged me to grow and to um, uh, take on some things that maybe I otherwise wouldn't have done. Right. And so I would say that's be that would be something I think any investor should do is join some type of mastermind, not necessarily just your local RIA group, which is great too, but that's not what I'm referring to. At that level, you're probably going to, you're probably the most successful person in the room if you're doing more than a, a deal a month. Right. Um, and I would encourage you to be part of a group where you're not the most successful person in the room. Yeah. For sure. um, and so that'll really stretch you and it'll give you a resource, a place to go to get some advice and some help when you're like, well, uh, I'm encountering this, you know, what do you think about that? And just have some people to talk to. I think that's extremely important. Um, the next piece of advice, I mean, if you want to start growing, if you haven't hired that administrative person, do so. I know sometimes it, that first hire can be the hardest. Uh, but it'll really make your life so much easier just to have somebody that you can just send a message. You're like, Hey, I need you to do this. Hey, I need you to do that. And you're not running around. If you want to, um, I, again, I forget, I like to credit the source and I forget the source, but I would encourage you assign a dollar value to your time. So if your time is worth a hundred dollars an hour, $500 an hour, thousand dollars an hour, um, don't do anything that you could hire somebody for less than what your time is worth. Yeah. And that'll allow you to focus on your business and more revenue producing activity rather than running around and doing the things that you can hire somebody else to do. Um, so uh, that would be that would be my advice. And, and then I think, uh, you know, figure out what you're good at and try to find a way to leverage what you're good at. So for example, in my business, I know it doesn't look like much. We just, we just bought this uh, office that I we're moving into and renovating right now. It's an older house, but, uh, what I mentioned earlier, what I'm good at is systems and process. So one of the things that I'm going to do to try to leverage that is um, I know that there's a lot of salespeople uh, or investors who want to grow, but they don't really want to deal with all the things that we're talking about. They don't want to deal with, you know, finding a better technology to manage their leads. They don't want to deal with managing phone systems. They don't want to deal with building landing pages for pay per click right. and Facebook marketing and all these things, which are in becoming increasingly important in this space. And so what I want to do is I want to partner with people like that. Um, I'll provide the infrastructure, the support, the marketing and the technology and allow them to uh, focus on meeting with sellers, growing their business. The idea is kind of uh, whether it's this particular example or another, one of the story, one of the examples I love is the Clydesdale horse. One Clydesdale can pull 4,000 pounds. So you would think, well, two Clydesdales can pull 8,000 pounds, right? Actually, that's not true. Two Clydesdales can pull 12,000 pounds. Oh, wow. But what's even more impressive, if those two Clydesdales are uh, experienced in working together, they can actually pull 16,000 pounds. Wow. So, and that's, I think, the, the what we're talking about with here of building a business. It's not just about doing a couple more deals or a few more deals. If you have the right team and there's synergy and you're, building on each other's strengths, instead of um, doubling your volume, you can 4X or 10X your volume yeah. just by bringing the right people into your business and letting somebody who's good at what they do, do what they do, and you can really focus on doing what you're good at. 
That's awesome, man. That's great. Uh, that's great uh, tips. That's a great tip. W- one other thing I'll add to that that I was just talking about last week when we were in the Investor Fuel Mastermind was that it took me – somebody said this to me at one point and it was just like you know, like a light kind of came on. Like I've been doing it wrong for all these years. But I would kind of hire people in an admin – like say, let's say an admin role. And in my mind, it's like, well, they there's no way they're going to generate revenue for us. I didn't necessarily th- – I didn't say that out loud, but it was kind of implied. Like they're an ex- they're just an expense. They're going to help make my life easier. But and then somebody said, well, every role you hire, even if it's a virtual assistant, you should have a component in there that they can help generate more revenue. So, you know, so all I did was like have my admin, for example, start evaluating. Like I was getting all these emails for investor deals and things that kind of come my way, which tr- tr- truthfully I didn't even have time to look at. And I was like, why don't I have my admins or my virtual assistants or everybody out trying to help us find more deals? Because then I can not only offset their cost, but we can, you know, grow revenue um, by, you know, it's it's not just offsetting their cost; it's actually growing it above and beyond what it costs them. I think yeah, idea, yeah. Uh, and it's an important benchmark in a business, right? Is what is your uh, how much revenue is if you take the revenue of the company and divide by the number of employees? That's you know, kind of get an idea of yeah. how much revenue. So even if it's not directly generating a deal. Um, your people should be increasing the capacity of your company to do to do business. Yep. And uh, you know, I, and that's a really tangible, practical way to hand, to tackle that. I think that's awesome. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, Martin, if folks wanted to get a hold of you uh, or learn more about what you're working on, I just mentioned some some opportunities that you might be rolling out where people could partner with you. Where where do they go to learn more about you or to get in touch with you? I would say go to my website, thetrustedhomebuyer.com. And again, there's a the in the front, so the trustedhomebuyer.com. And we have, uh, if they want to learn more about me and how we do business, uh, we have a really great 30 minute um, uh, webinar that uh, kind of describes what we do. I would encourage them to watch it if they're interested. Um, and then we also have a, you know, of course, there's the contact us button. If they want it, somebody wants to send me a message, uh, I'd love to hear from them and, and awesome. Take from there. Awesome, awesome. We'll add a link down below. Uh, for that as well. So, Martin, great to see you, my friend. Thanks for sharing with us. Hey, you're welcome, Mike. It was great to be here. Thanks yeah, for having always, me. Yeah, always good talking to you. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Everybody, hey, this is show number 379. So I'm um, getting a little bit better at asking people at the end of the show. If you, if you enjoyed this show and you have uh, listened to more of our shows, we, we really would love a positive uh, rating in iTunes or um, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, or even YouTube, anywhere where you watch us or listen. If you could subscribe and, and give us a, a share, a little love that gives us the energy to keep uh, to keep to do another hundred and three three hundred to do a, an additional three hundred and seventy nine shows. So appreciate the uh, support of the show. Thanks for watching us, and we'll see you in another upcoming episode. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the FlipNerd.com Investing Show. If you're not yet an elite member of FlipNerd, you're missing out. We have tons of great training, including a new detailed masterclass published each month and live training webinars with experts twice a month. Plus you'll get access to all of our archives where we already have a growing library of masterclasses and other training videos. Elite members also get membership in our incredible online mastermind group where many of the top real estate investors from across the country, including many of the hundreds of guests I've had on the show in the past are already members. Whether you're brand new looking to get started, or a veteran, you simply must join today. I promise you won't be disappointed. To learn more or join today, please visit flipnerd.com slash lab. That's flipnerd.com slash lab. See you on the next show.